So welcome again to our final segment of the Local Food Summit. In this last session, um, I wanted to address some of the things that uh, we've experienced from a community's perspective. Becky and I have been living in a small community for almost 40 years and have had a chance to experience what it's like to create a more permanent community or to uh, work with others working through challenges as well as around challenges. And um, during the interviews that we've done with the four individuals that uh, we've recorded, each one of them ended up touching on key points to the bigger picture here to this local food movement. Certainly the nuts and the bolts are important. Certainly how we grow food. Certainly how we set up the network. Certainly how we do commerce and how we the economics of everything. All of this is important. It's all critical. But even if we have the best ideas and we start putting things into motion, if we don't get the people part right, if we don't focus or learn or we don't realize how important that people part is, we'll fail or we'll continue to struggle. It's paramount in the process of moving us forward into creating a more meaningful culture, more meaningful society, and creating caring for the earth while we're caring for one another, it's critical that we have to grow too, we as individuals. I um, kind of liken who we are as the human species on the planet and what we would say in the Western culture of consumption is we're like seventh graders. Emotionally, we're still seventh graders. And uh, in that the way we live our life, we're just, it's kind of like mom and dad are away from home for the weekend and We've got the house to ourselves, and we've invited our friends over. Uh, the door's open, the furnace is on, the TV's on, the stereo's going. We've, you know, emptied the liquor cabinet. Um, we're making a mess of the house. This really is a pretty good analogy to who we are as the human species right now. We really are consuming and making a mess and consuming vast amount of energy and with no thought towards where we need to be in the future at North, very little thought towards how we are caring for future generations. I think what life is asking of us now is to step up and to become adults. Life is asking us to step forward into a, a grander experience of ourselves that we know is there, but that as a culture, we're not calling it out of ourselves. So we have to do it individually. Each one of us has to do this individually. And the beautiful thing about it is, in the process of doing this, all kinds of wonder ends up showing up. It's so worthwhile paying attention to who we are as human beings and what the possibilities are and calling the greater the greaterness out of ourselves. Um, I made a note here about um, th uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau. I think this comes out of Walden. I think his book, Walden where he says that when one advances confidently in the direction of their own dreams and they endeavor to live the life which they hath imagined, they will meet with success, unexpected, and in common hours. So let's take that apart a little bit. When one advances confidently in the direction of their own dreams, meaning that what are, are my dreams? What are your dreams? What is it that we really want to create? I'm asking this question. It's that question we ask ourselves when we wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and the house is quiet and we're sitting there and maybe our life is a little bit crazy or we're working all the time or our relationships are out of whack, our kids are having problems or we're the problem. But we wake up in the middle of the night and we ask ourselves, what in the heck is going on? Is this all there is? Is this all there really is? That is a golden moment. That is a question to hang on to, because it's not. What we've created here in our culture is very, we're just scratching the surface of what's possible for us as the human species. We're just barely, we are seventh graders. As a culture, that's what we are. So when one advances confidently in the direction of their own dreams, we're talking about the dreams of the heart, that thing that we ache to do, that thing that we ache to experience where we know that there's a lot more to life than just this job and this check, that somehow we want deeper meaning in our life. We want to make a contribution. There are three things, you know, that I can see that really create joy in somebody's life. 
One is you either need to be learning. Two, you need to be really involved in whatever you're doing, meaningful work, meaningful activity, purposeful work. And thirdly, you need to be contributing. You need to be or we need to be doing something for others. When we're doing those three things, life makes sense. And when we're not doing those three things, we get lost in the mire. So when one advances confidently in the direction of their own dreams, and I'm talking about the dreams of the heart, the dreams of greaterness, the dreams of wonder, when one advances confidently in the direction of their own dreams and endeavors to live the life which they have imagined. So how many times do we stop ourselves from stepping into the life we want because our culture says that's the wrong way or we're going to offend somebody or we're going to hurt somebody? But we know we need to step into this experience. We need to move into this change. We need to advance confidently in the direction of our own dreams and endeavor to live the life that we have, have imagined. Then we will meet with success, unexpected and in common hours. What he doesn't tell you in that little quote there is that the you-know-what is going to hit the fan first. When we make these changes, when we step out of our comfort zone, it's very uncomfortable and there'll be a lot of change and there could be a lot of disturbance. But if we're true to ourselves and we move with integrity, not with abusiveness, not with animosity, um, not with pigheadedness, but with just a sense of conviction and clarity, not making anybody else wrong, just saying, this is what I need. Eventually, we come out on the other side and we do get success. We do find successes and they're unexpected and in common hours. Like in the interview that we did with Robin, I loved near the end where she talked about an unexpected benefit that she got from the work she was doing in all of those community gardens. Let's cut to that segment right now so you can hear what she had to say and what she experienced by stepping into this work. I think that I came into Philadelphia and started getting obsessed with growing food and learning about plants at a really pretty pivotal time in this urban agriculture movement. And as a result, um, although it hasn't been that many years, I have a ton, I have an extremely large network. Um, and I have been able to kind of stand back and, and reflect a lot this year on all of the people in the city that I have helped to uh, maybe connect with a job or an internship or um, maybe uh, they're going to school for horticulture now or, um, you know, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I give job recommendations all the time. I write letters of reference all the time. I um, refer people for training programs all the time. And I am doing a lot more teaching as time goes on, designing a lot of my own classes to just get people to, you know, do a bunch of information dumping on anybody who's interested. <laughs> um, and that has resulted in all sorts of really incredible things, you know, knowing people pretty much everywhere I go and realizing, you know, Oh, I haven't seen that person in a while. That's because they decided to leave the city and work on a farm for a season or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that feels really great um, because it's given me more of a, a perspective and an understanding that like the weight of all of these things is not just on my shoulders and that I'm very consciously doing a lot of work to make sure that there are tons of people that are now doing the work and that the work will continue happening even if I decide that I need to do something else with my life. Um, that feels really, really good. And I think that's a huge amount of what it's about. Isn't that nice? So for Robin, it was realizing she had made so many connections that her life had become so rich and so meaningful and that she was able to touch so many people's lives and so many people's lives touched her. If she hadn't fully engaged in that work and given fully of herself, she wouldn't have reaped those benefits. These are these unexpected rewards. These are the gifts that show up when we step into our life of authenticity, when we step into the grander experience of ourselves. Yes, it will be difficulty. There will be difficulty, but we will also experience tremendous gifts. Some of you may have seen this um, uh, video where they 
take a droplet of water and they put it on a plate and they run a sound wave through it. And as the sound wave increases, the bubble is, uh, they put a microscope on it and the bubble is all dis, you know, discombobulated and it's wiggling in all different directions. But at a certain frequency, all of a sudden a simple geometric, a sh- geometric shape appears in that water droplet as it vibrates at that frequency and you get this perfect shape and perfect clarity. Then if you take the frequency and continue to raise it up, all of a sudden that breaks apart and you get a lot of chaos again. And then at another frequency, it locks in again and you get another geometric shape, this time more complicated or more complex than the first. And once again, when you turn up the frequency, it once again, it goes into uh, chaos and then finally locks in to another clarity. That's exactly what happens to us in the human experience as we go through life that we'll hit these periods of time when everything is out of whack and everything is just going crazy and it forces us to look more deeply, look more clearly, to make decisions that we need to make. And when we do that, we step into our power. It doesn't feel like it at the time because we're trusting, but we we step into a grander experience of ourselves. All of a sudden, there'll be a period of time where everything lines up and we'll get this clarity and we'll realize we're in the right place at the right time that we had made the right decisions, and that we were reaping that reward. But if we want to continue to grow, then life will become chaotic again. We'll go through another period where things get really tense and crazy, and then finally we lock in again. This is how life works. What permaculture asks are two basic questions. What is and how do things work? That's it. There are no sacred cows in permaculture. It's not like there's a belief system. All it is, it says, look, how does this thing work? How does life work? And all we're trying to do in permaculture is align the way we live to the universe and how it actually works. And the way we grow is in order to move from this level of of understanding and competence into the next level, a greater level of understanding competence, we have to leave this behind. And when you go from here to here, it's scary. And things fall apart and it's crazy. But that's the way it works. And so for those of you who know this, you know, I commend you. I commend myself. I commend anybody who understands it's going to be crazy for a while. But you understand you're going for a grander experience of, of life and of yourself. You're calling more out of yourself. And you will get there. Because it's the way it works. It's just this. And then from this point, there'll be another point and another point. I don't think it ever ends. It's probably infinite, right? There have always been great under people um, in our midst, no matter where we were in history, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, you know, 2,000 years ago, there have always been people in our midst who had this sense of clarity, who had this sense of awareness, who broke through the cultural experience and entered into this greater experience and understanding of the human spirit and of the hu- of human nature. And so they were able to step out of the culture they found themselves in and look at the human experience from a broader perspective. And with that comes great clarity, comes great understanding, even some greater compassion, and uh, the ability to advise, the ability to guide. There have always been those that have been able to do that. Um, the majority of us will tear them down. If we they, they show up, we get rid of them. <laughs> but they've been there. And most of us, you've run into them. If you're not one of them, you've run into them. And uh, you know they exist. And you know that there's this knowing. There's this deepness. There's this connection. And we know it's real. That's what we have to pay attention to. That's what's being called out of us out of, for humans for the next... That's our, that's our work for the next 500 to 1,000 years. So I love the fact that all four of the people that we've interviewed touched on this in one way or the other. The next one, like I wanted to mention here, was Jordan. Um, you know, Jordan, um, he, he figured it out at an, at an earlier age because of the challenges he went through. Um, he was able to put things into motion and became financially secure. So he's a young, you know, to me, he's a young guy. He's in his early 40s. But uh, he doesn't have to go anymore. He, has, he doesn't have to do anything else anymore. He could just retire. He could stop. But he doesn't. And the reason is, is because there's more to do. He's here to serve. He's here to create. He's here to do what he can to make sure every human on this planet has enough. 
and that the planet is cared for at the same time. So he has this vision that's going to take a minimum of 28 years. It's a 28-year plan he has for the farm down in the Missouri, the other planet farm that we're involved with and honored to be so. Um, let's play this segment where Jordan talks about his work and uh, why he's doing it. And, you know, sometimes you do something when you have a very small window of understanding and you look back and say, why did I do that? You know, I'm not as much concerned, Bill, why we bought thousands of acres in South Central Missouri. Uh, and when people ask me, why did you do this? I don't want to look back at the circumstances that drove me to, to start. I want to look forward to the solution that we're going to provide. And that is simply food, clothing, shelter, hydration, and protection for people. Because I just believe we're going to need it. The bottom line is, if you look back thousands of years, the only things that were valuable then are the only true things that were valu that are valuable today. Our ancestors would scoff at us if they thought that we paid for everything with a piece of plastic using money we don't own to buy something from someone else that doesn't own what they're selling us. So to me, what's real? What can you step on? What can you feed with, hydrate with? shelter and protect. Obviously, that's grandiose and uh, nonspecific, but that really drove me. And now, all these years later, I'm trying to look at the resources that I currently have, not figure out why I have them, but use what I have to the best of my ability with the God-given resources and maximize abundance and efficiency. And hey, whether you've got a backyard, a potted plant, or 4,000 acres in South Central Missouri, we all need to do that. And I'm, I suspect many people watching today don't have a clue where to start. Yeah, so that's it. It has to do with doing it because it just needs to be done. Doing it because it's the right thing to do. And um, to be able to just step into that, the vision he has is so big it's hard for me to imagine how we're ever going to get there. But who cares? As he says, you know, he doesn't want to look back and, and apologize or try to figure out why, you know, what went wrong. He's going forward. He's just saying, what can we do? And um, I love that. I love that in Jordan. And I love the fact that I get to work with that. And then this interview with Marty, um, you know, Marty and, and uh, Chris and Will have done this, this amazing thing where they've created this project where now they're helping about 60 other farmers make a living off the land by direct marketing to the chefs and to the restaurants. And it's not just the economic component. They're really looking for the healthiest food. There are a lot of people that are sick and they're figuring out a way to get the healthiest food they can to the restaurants. And now the chefs can provide that food to their clients as well as people can buy that food individually from them. But Marty, you know, realizes that we... You know, all of us have received so many gifts. Um, isn't isn't it just our responsibility to figure out a way to give back? Here's a little segment of Marty, and he talks about um, uh, John Eichert and uh, what John has to say about this. Marty feels the same way. Let's take a look at this segment. So I'm hoping that, you know, people that, that hear this will understand Make sure you give that younger generation an opportunity mm -hmm. um, to succeed. Um, I, know, I know people who are in their 40s and, you know, they've said, well, my dad won't even give me an acre to farm on, my, on our family farm, and he farms a thousand acres. He's not interested in, in any of this. Mm -hmm. How, what do I do? I says, well, you've got to find somebody to get you some land. <laughs> So yeah. we, I think we all have a responsibility to help each other. You know, John Eichard talks about that in, in many of his talks and, and publications. We owe a debt to those who came before us. Yeah. And we can only repay that to people right. of the future. Passing it to the future, yeah. So with that, I, I hope that we can all do that. Yeah. Thank you, Marty. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marty. So that inspires me, just knowing Marty, uh, Chris, and, and Will. Um, they inspire me, you know, just to, to keep doing what I'm doing. 
you think about this this idea of this process of um you know who we are as human beings and you know we owe a debt to those who came before us and laid down this groundwork and and the way we pay that back is by paying it forward or providing something to the future but i look at this and you know you think about it um you know how long is our lifespan how long do we live you know what's our life if we live 100 years let's say but what is a hundred years in relationship to maybe the amount of time that the planet has been here or the from geological perspective? How many of us know who our great, great, great grandparents were and what their lives were like? What were their thoughts? What were their concerns? What were their successes? What were the things they ached about? Who were they? What was their life really like just three generations ago? for. We don't know who they are. Most of us don't know. Do you think anybody's going to remember us three generations from now? Look, our lives, even if we live 100 years, in the course, in, in, in relationship to time itself, it's a snap. Our 100 years is nothing. It's here and it's gone and we will not be remembered. I'm sorry. I know this is hard to hear maybe. But remember, permaculture asks the question, what is and how do things work, right? And what is, is you and I will not be remembered 100 years from now, 200 years from now. No one will know that we ever existed. And yet, you and I can wake up tomorrow morning, and through the course of tomorrow, we can experience a thousand moments of consciousness, a thousand moments of appreciation, a thousand moments of of being aware of what's around us. Every day can be filled with preciousness and awareness and observation. And think of every month and every year, on and on. Our lives can seem infinite. And yet in reality, they're a drop. They're a moment. We live in a paradox. We live in a pretty strange situation in that life can seem so big And at the same time, it can be so brief. We need to embrace this. We need to understand that we're part of that process. Permaculture recognizes patterns. And one of the patterns is is that life is brief and life is long all at the same time. That there are paradoxes. And this isn't that hard to to hold. But it also gives us an understanding when we realize that, well, what is, if we are here for 100 years, which only goes like this, what should we do with that 100 years? Is the reason we're here to drive cars real fast, to buy more houses, to eat more food, to take more vacations? Those things are nice. They're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But is that the purpose of life? Is that the reason we showed up on the planet? There is so much more to life than what this culture that we've created shares or worships. It is, it's, it is a gift. It is an amazing opportunity to become conscious and aware and to step into a grander experience of ourselves. There's a, there's a great quote by um, uh, James Allen. And uh, this was written 150 years ago. So he talks about man and he's referring to the human experience. But I'm going to quote it based on the way he wrote it. But he said, a man only begins to be a man when he ceases to whine and revile and commences to search for the hidden justice that regulates all life. And as he adapts his mind to that regulating factor, he ceases to accuse others as the cause of his condition, but builds himself in strong and noble thoughts. He ceases to kick against circumstances, but begins to use them as aids to his more rapid progress and as a means of discovering the hidden powers and possibilities within. The hidden powers and possibilities within. We really only step into ourselves. We really only step into a powerful experience of ourselves when we stop whining, we stop complaining, we stop blaming our circumstances, and we align ourselves with what is and how things really work. We look for ways to become more more knowing, We look for ways to be of greater service. We look for meaningful work, meaningful contributions. 
and we look for the hidden powers and possibilities within. We don't go after them. Going after them chases them away. We live authentically. We live consciously. We live carefully. And as a result, we become more knowing, more loving, more capable. And it's just the way it works. And it's worth it. It's like, what else is there? I'm sorry. There's only so much football I can take. There's only so much NASCAR I can take. There's only so much professional wrestling I can take. It's all entertainment. It's all just um, temporary. It's all just a distraction. But there is, there are things in life that are worthwhile and meaningful. And um, they're around us all the time. And the key one is leaving the planet in better condition. You know, we're here for a short period of time. That hundred years, it's going to go like this. So when we, you and I were here, when we left, did we leave this place in better condition because we were here? It's absolutely possible to do that. And actually, that's what the Permaculture Design Course does, is it lays out all the things that we can do as human beings so that we can look back in time and say, thank God these people were here because they left the planet in better condition than when they arrived on it. That's the work before all of us. That's the work behind the local food movement, is how do we heal the soil? How do we grow really healthy food? How do we basically get to the point where we don't need a medical industry? We don't need industrial agriculture. You know, We can create these systems where there's pure abundance and security, and we don't need any of these huge systems, and we can care for the planet at the same time. And finally, in this the interview that we did with Ray, uh, Ray Archuleta, um, here is Ray. He's a, a soil scientist and a conservationist through the United States Department of Agriculture, and he's really interested in soils, and he's just really lit up about that whole thing. And he, and it, as you remember from his interview, he had this epiphany when he was uh, in uh, working for the Department of Agriculture, and he just knew something was wrong in Virginia City. And so he opened the door. He went behind and said, oh, my gosh, look at all the challenges behind industrial agriculture. But look, there are people that have solved these problems. Why aren't we all doing this? But as he says, the big problem is not the problem of just doing it. It has to do with the problem um, in our own minds. Uh, let's listen to this seg segment of Ray. And uh, here's a, you know, a guy right out of the Department of Agriculture who's talking about spiritual stuff. I mean, he's talking about life itself. He's talking about the big changes. Yeah, it's been a challenge. I think one of the things that we're going to need is an army of young people and agriculturists who are ecologically focused. And because, let me tell you, farming is not easy. Ranching is not easy. And the transitions are going to be painful. Mm -hmm. It's going to be painful because... You have to take risk. You have to be well read. You have to change completely. The most most difficult thing in the planet to change is what between what's between the years. Hmm. The human mind. Yeah. This is why we have failed miserably. We've been trying to get it with money. We've been trying to throw science at it. Those are not going to fix it. The, the only way we're going to fix it is the transformation of the human heart and mind. Understanding that it's it, it looks at the system wrong. It, it has to realize that it's part of the system. There has to be an appreciation and a love for the land, a rekindling for it. And until that occurs, we're not going to fix our issues. Our issues are cultural, social, psychological, and even the fact spiritual in nature. All these together. That's why my one of the top principles I teach, the principles of soul health, is... You've got to understand your social, your cultural, your uh, your psychological, and your spiritual context, and ecological context, 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 context. Mm -hmm. It is our pernicious human nature to be very greedy and want something for nothing, and yet have no love and respect for the land. That's our biggest thing. Yeah. And the second one I use is called, you cannot build ecological integrity without human integrity. It's yeah. not going to happen. We will not follow the principles of soil health. We will not apply uh, the principles of biomimicry or uh, permaculture unless you have integrity. Right. Integrity to study, 
to be committed, not to give up, and to withstand the mockery of the neighbors. Well, thank you for that, Ray. So I guess what I really would like to leave you with is um, a tool. Um, I've been um, interested in thinking about this kind of thing for 35, 40 years, and maybe even a little longer than that now. Um, and there have been a few things that have come across my path that have really helped me understand um, the culture as it exists and my own personal journey within that experience. And uh, it's a real simple uh, uh, suggestion. Um, it's, a, it's a simple book. It's called um, The Four Agreements by uh, Don Miguel Ruiz. It's a short read, but it's incredibly powerful because he basically describes the culture and he describes how we get into it and our experience and how we basically are formed by the culture that we're in. But that at some point we can all step out of that. We can step out of the culture and get to know who, who we really are as human beings, not as a person in that culture, but we can step out of that experience. And the way we do that is we keep four agreements with ourselves. And the uh, four agreements real simply, um, I do want you to get the book, but the first agreement is you have to become or we have to become impeccable with our word. Honesty is so key to everything because it's what is. Um, honesty, it, it, life itself is honest. Uh, life does not cheat itself. Life just is what it is. And we as humans, when we align ourselves with truth, when we align ourselves with honesty, then we become aligned with what is. We become anchored in reality rather than some fantasy. So um, becoming, you know, being truthful is very, very important. The second thing is um, to not make assumptions. That it's, it's easy to um, assume that people are doing things for certain reasons or um, saying things for certain reasons, but we don't really know. So checking those assumptions are, is really important and allowing people just to be who they are and not assume anything about them. The, the third agreement is to not take things personally. Um, it's really a common thing in our culture to assume and that people are doing things to offend us or um, that we. it's easy for us to become offended or affected by what's around us. And it's important to know that this is not, this is just, I know it's normal, but it's not, it's not what makes us who we are. It's not what makes us respond. For example, you know, you could be five people standing around and one person says something. One person says one thing and the person next to them is horrified. The person across them starts laughing. The other person is, becomes angry and this other person becomes disgusted. So now you got one person saying one thing and you got four different reactions going on what that one person said. Who created all that emotion? Who created all of that drama? Who created all that emotional response? This person is a stimulus. This first person, they just said something. But everybody else had a different experience. Look, we create our own experience of the life around us. That person said something, but each one of those four individuals created their own response based on their attitudes based on their childhood experiences, based on their own insecurities, usually. When you're late and, um, you know, and you're late for work and you, you, there's traffic and you're blacked up, backed up, and there's not supposed to be traffic, you know, it's so easy to get mad because, well, oh, traffic shouldn't be this way. And you get to work, and, oh, traffic was terrible, and everybody agrees, oh, yeah, traffic is terrible. You know, if the traffic had gotten up that morning and said, hey, Bill's going to be late to work today, let's back up and really, you know, let's really make him angry, right? Well, I might have a reason then to be angry, right? But the traffic doesn't care. The traffic is just traffic. And yet I chose to get angry about it, right? This person that said this one thing, they're just that person. They are who they are from their own experience in life. They are who they are. Can I change them? No. Probably not. They're just saying one thing, and yet we have all these different responses. Nobody needed to respond that way to that person. They could just look at that person and say, oh yeah, that's Joe. Joe's always been like that. That's what Joe's going to say. And it, does, it just rolls off your back. We don't take it personally. This is huge. This is huge, huge. All right? And then the fourth one is to um, do your best each day. And some day our best is pretty good. Other days it's not very good. 
But if we do our best every day, what more can anybody ask of us? None of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to fall down. We're all going to wish we hadn't said something or hadn't done something or wish we had done something. But there's always tomorrow. There's another day. We can step into it. We can step into the grander experience of ourselves day after day. And as we become impeccable with our word and we don't take things personally, we don't make assumptions and we do our best, as we do these things day after day after day, we become more solid, more clear, more conscious, more loving, more compassionate, more capable. Our emotions don't run us anymore. In this book, Don Miguel Ruiz, and these are the ancient Toltecs that figured this out. These four agreements come from a thousand years ago. The Toltecs, these are pre-Mayan and pre-Aztec. They said if you can keep these four agreements with yourself, you can clean up 80% of the drama in your life. So I'd have to, I have to tell you, I've been working with these for 30 years. It's cleaned up a lot in my life. So hopefully it'll do the same for others. But that's what I want to leave you with. I just um, want to thank Lynette Marie and Michael for hosting this um, local food summit. I think it's really important and I'm glad they've done it. And I'm honored to have been a part of it, as is Becky. And to those of you who've made it this far and are watching this video, um, I want to thank you for staying with it as well. Um, this is a big thing. This is a big project. It takes a lot of thinking to go through what it's going to take to create this new movement, to create a, a new way of look, working with the world. You know, we're asking ourselves to change, we're asking ourselves to change the way we've been doing agriculture for 10,000 years. This is a big deal. But we can do it. We need to do it. It's time to do it. It's not that hard either. We could actually make this change in a short period of time. But we can't drag others with us. All we can do is do our work. We need to let go of others. We need to let go of everybody else and walk into it ourselves. We need to walk confidently in the direction of our own dreams. There's a great quote by, um, I, it's attributed to uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, and he says, always, always, always preach the gospel. And when you have to, and only when you have to, use words. <laughs> and the gospel is walk the talk. The gospel is make some changes. Small steps at first, and then bigger steps and bigger steps. Purchase food from those who are doing the work. Let's buy food from those that are caring for the land. Stop buying food from those that are destroying the land and not caring for animals and not caring for, for others. We start small. We just make the steps. And over time, it makes a big difference. And we will probably influence others because of the choices that we make. But they got to be real and they got to be solid. And I guess all I want to say is I think it's totally worthwhile. Um, I mean, what else are we going to do? <laughs> what else are we going to do with our life? Staying unconscious is not a choice, I don't think. It's so much fun. It's so interesting. <laughs> and it's a little crazy at times. But uh, it's worth it. So good luck to all of you. Thank you for being outside the box. Thank you for thinking this way. Thank you for being willing to be part of the change. I'll see you down the road. Bye.